And welcome back to another episode of Dirt to Dust presented by Outlaw Offroad. I am your host, Doug Langford, once again here with Caleb Forbes. And we have a heck of an episode for you guys today. Can't wait to get into it. Um, I'm really liking that we're getting into these interviews, Caleb. We had the the great interview with with Justin that was both fun and educational, I think. Maybe a little more fun than educational, mm-hmm. but hopefully some people got some education out of it. Um, but looking I forward to so. definitely <laughs> getting in on this one. This is one that we've had um, kind of on the books for a while. Want to get to it. Uh, that's kind of the whole audible thing we called last week with getting Justin in here just because of some of that stuff that was going on on social media. But we have uh, we have Dan Ford, the founder of Next Venture Motorsports out of Grand Junction, Colorado with us today. So um, I am not going to talk too much more about this one because I just want to get right into this. So uh, let's get after it. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to to Dust. Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. And welcome back to Dirt to Dust, Doug. Thank you for that intro. And like Doug said, we do have Dan here today. Super excited about this interview. The last interview with Justin went pretty well, and uh, I'm really, really looking forward to this interview with Dan as well. We've got a lot to pick his brain about. Dan, how are you? Oh, not too bad. Thank you guys for having me on. This is uh, honestly the first podcast I've ever attended to be on. So, <laughs> Well, hopefully it's not the last because uh, we, uh, we try to make a good impression here. <laughs> so, Dan, let's just start from kind of the beginning here. Um Let's let's hear a bit about you personally. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about themselves, but uh, let's hear a little bit about you, your background, and uh, kind of what got you into off roading. Uh, what got me into off roading predates Next Venture Motorsports by a pretty good long shot. Uh, <laughs> my my grandfather had a '73 uh, Jeep Commando and uh, a lot of property out in Pennsylvania, and we lived on the East Coast when I was younger. We go out there he would take us out jeeping uh, i mean by the time we were 70 he had a small collection of them he had he had two of those everybody that owns a jeep commando has a spare one for parts because they're <laughs> rare and rusty on the east coast uh, sorry marvin right <laughs> <laughs> uh, i love marvin's jeepster but uh th- then he had himself a, a 55 cj5 with a, a chevy v8 swapped into it and you know, you find out really quick that if you don't build the Jeep correctly and you hit the gas too hard, the uh, drive shaft that was in there from the factory that you may have shortened is just going to fall out from underneath it. And these are all really good things to know long before you turn 16 years old and you want to build your own. So that that is probably uh, where the start of this came from. Uh, my other grandfather, on the other hand, was very much into hot rods. Uh, he had a 33 Plymouth, a 34 Ford. Uh, both EFI swapped IFS, uh, out of, I mean, he, he had fun with these things and that left a big impression on me too. So going to either one of my grandfather's farms was a, uh, any motorhead's dream or Jeepers dream. And here I am today, uh, getting to actually live that, which is pretty incredible. That's awesome. So what brought you from Pennsylvania to Colorado? Uh, so, so my grandfather's always been in PA. Uh, I was actually born in Michigan. We moved to upstate New York when I was really young. We moved between New York and Arizona like six times uh, for my dad's work. Uh, so I, I mostly grew up down in Tucson, and they have a huge rock crawling scene there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, my, my dad's work brought us there. But uh, the, the desert, being able to go to places like... Uh, Reddington Pass or Table Mesa, uh, all all things like that. That was, you know, my my high school uh, weekends when I could 
find a way out to them. And that really just got me sucked into rock crawling pretty hard. Man, we may have to edit out that part where he says he's from Michigan. I don't know if I can. <laughs> <sighs> man. No, you're 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 outweighed on man, this. You've got have, two people man, on this I'm podcast. Just, man, in man, Michigan, podcast. So. I just have to get exploded. <laughs> from mi- well, luckily you didn't stay there very yeah. long, and now you're in a now you're in the cool part of a pretty cool state. I do like Colorado. That's a pretty cool place, and and Grand Junction, and to live what what are you like an hour and forty five minutes from Moab there or something like that? If uh, yeah, but about an hour and a half from Moab, hour forty five minutes from uh, from Uray, and that's I mean everybody here is Colorado, and they assume. You know Denver or something where you've got to drive five hours to get anywhere. You're right, man. That place is where it's at. Man, it's beautiful. It's hard to be. Little Switzerland, man. It is absolutely beautiful. We did. I've been to URA several times, but we did several days there for an event that we did back a couple summer ago, American Crawlers, and we spent days there. And we took a group of of Jeepers up, and we did Black Bear, and we did uh, I'm a Gene, and we did all that stuff. And they were just none of them. I don't think any of them had been there before, and. They just half of them freaked out on Black Bear. It was, but the comments were <laughs> uniform across the board of how how absolutely um, how absolutely beautiful it was. But were you, so were you in Grand Junction before you started Next Venture Motorsports, or did you actually go to Grand Junction to start Next Venture? Um, that's a neither. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, so, now I'm about to get the good info. Well, or maybe a little bit of both. Uh, so Next Venture kind of started off as a hobby of mine, and I would call it 2013, 2014. Uh, had a college roommate that caved in one of his rock sliders on his uh, on his TJ and sold it to the next roommate. There were three of us living there. And the things just wouldn't bolt on to a fresh tub. So... Shocker. I happened to be working at a little engineering firm at the time, had access to SolidWorks both at home and at work. I was managing a lot of our sheet metal vendor relationships and happened to have an off-road vendor in town. I was like, oh, I think I can draw this up in a couple hours. We'll get you a new one that's better than this, maybe a little bit thicker. Bolted that set on. We also all happened to be at an off-road club at the U of A. I mean, these guys were alumni at this point, but we were still attending meetings and somebody saw the custom corner armor that we just had laser cut or I'm sorry, rocker guards for the TJ. And then somebody else wanted something and then somebody else wanted something. And Uh eventually this kind of turned into all of that. Um, But really it wasn't my, my full-time job until about four years ago, Uh, me and my wife decided we wanted to, go 100% in on this and Grand Junction or St. George were kind of the two areas that we were debating. Like, how do you be close to all the wheeling? Mm -hmm. Uh, My wife really wanted to be close to Uray. That's where we're always heading in the summer, Uh, especially coming from Tucson. It's worth that nine, 10 hour drive to get out of the heat in the middle of the summer. We're just in love with the place. So Grand Junction, here we are. I do love that area. So, where does the name come from? Next Venture Motorsports. I mean, obviously, we know where the motorsports comes from. How did you come up? Where? Where does? Is there a basic for that name? Like, where did it come from? Um, it it kind of comes from a, a combination of ideas. I was I was kicking around the idea of starting this as a business rather than a hobby, uh, with a couple of potential friends, business partners, that kind of thing. Um, just bouncing names off the wall and and. Uh, it was suggested to me, hey, you know, New Venture is like, they've got such a good name in there. And it's it's such a shame that nobody is going to continue that name. I was like, you know, that, that's really not a bad name. It's just the definition of venture fits so well with that. But if you're going to do that, you you want to be original. And perhaps that is not the most original way to, to come up with a name. I, I kind of always figured we'd come up with something better later. But it, it kind of stuck, and we haven't come up with a better name since, and I'm pretty excited to go on my next adventure every time I'm <laughs> I looking say, at I was going to say, I kind of like it. Yeah, so I totally get it. It it stuck, and... Dig it. Okay. I always wondered that. I always wondered if it was like something like 
that was if that was a story behind that or but i think i mean so many companies have you know you, you hear the story and other people are like oh it's a cool story and the guy who's like actually naming the company is like yeah this sounds really dumb but this is why i did it and everybody else is like <laughs> oh that makes total sense i wish it were either dumber or way way more clever but it's not <laughs> But it's a good name, and here we are, and that's this is it's not changing. It is next no, venture no, forever. It's not. No, next venture forever. Yeah, it's it's literally laser cut and engraved now. So yeah, it's, can't change it. it. Can't nope, change. You're done. <laughs> oh, cool. Moving on from that. Um, so now that we know how next venture started, um, what do y'all do? What is next venture? What in, in its entire? Uh, you know, when it started, it was a few little things here and there uh mostly steel aftermarket parts for the tj the xj the commando even because i had to have one of those uh mm. but now it's uh i think what we're known for is uh armor for the jl wrangler the jt uh then we then we had a bunch of people asking when is the jk version of this coming out and, and for the longest time i didn't even want to jump into the jk market it's so saturated there are more mm -hmm. jk's out there than practically anything and so many folks have done it so well already but if you sit down and think about it yeah there is a new way to do every one of those things and as we're starting to get people asking us you know when is the jk version of this part that i just saw in your jl going to be available uh, we, we pushed that off for a minute but now it's happening and uh, I, I would say those are those are the three big Jeep platforms, and then we also do uh, Bronco belly skids because there's not a lot of folks putting aluminum and UHMW under those either. And uh, I, I think that's what we're uh, most known for right now is is kind of taking the UHMW mm -hmm. that makes it slip and slide over rocks and put that underneath every platform we work on. Yeah, absolutely. So that's kind of interesting that you started with the newest and you're kind of retrofitting and working backwards. Whereas most of the people I would say in this industry got their start working on probably TJLJ stuff way back in the day. Uh, and, you know, when the JK came out in 07, they, they modified to that platform and then kind of moved forward and got dimensions and measured off of JLs and, and a frenzy and then the JK. So it's kind of cool to hear someone starting with the new stuff, focusing on that. And then saying, yeah, we'll, we'll worry about the old guys a little bit later, but we want to, we want the newest, we want the greatest, we want to have our best foot the forward. The market was um, just wide open at the time, so it made a lot yeah, of sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it does make a lot of sense to have UHMW under there, too. I've actually thought about doing that on the LJ, um, just as a sacrificial layer, so you're not, you know, you just slide off of things, and if, if you mess it up, you just replace it. So it's cool that you're integrating that, because I don't think I can think of anyone else in, in this industry doing that so way to be innovative um that's kind of ties into something that doug and i talked about and it, it it's funny it kind of keeps reoccurring a as well, a theme here with this one uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so obviously there was a decision to be made to use uhmw under your stuff um I would imagine from some R and D for some wheeling, some personal experience. And uh, so talk to me a little bit about how, how you design products to do something like that or what your R and D process looks like. Uh, so, so the R and D process, what, what that typically looks like to us. Uh, I typically see it as, as there's almost four different types of, of R and D that, that I get to interact with uh, on a, almost daily basis. One is how do we, how do we take something from a flat piece of metal and turn it into this pinion guard? Because that's the solution we're after. Uh, the, the second one is, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on iterative design, uh, different iterations based on customer feedback or what we're seeing uh, on an ultra four JL, or if I get to do some real world testing myself, what did I break? versus what a dug break on the car. Uh, those are all good ways to, <laughs> to really learn. Uh, you, you can simulate it. You can do finite element analysis all day long in SolidWorks, but that's not going to tell you uh, nearly as much as real world testing. Uh, not as, not as quickly. Uh, and then the other two types are, you know, sometimes you're matching uh, you're, you're doing an iteration, not because of feedback, but because you need this to bolt up to a factory vehicle and the OEM made a change. 
either for a really good reason or a very arbitrary reason. And you, you get a text message from your buddy that might know somebody at Jeep saying, Hey, good news. There's another set of motor mounts and we're throwing a different oil pan under the 392 mid year. And you might want to design around that. Good luck. Um, you're kind of forced sure to do that one that. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, the, and then the fourth one is, you know, sort of customer service R and D. You you get a call. Maybe you've shipped a thousand of these things and you've never had a problem. They fit all three vehicles you didn't install uh, in house on, but somebody finds a new problem, a new incompatibility. Maybe it's a tolerance on the Jeep. Uh, maybe it's that they don't want to admit that they got T boned last month and their frame isn't uh, anywhere near factory spec anymore, or maybe they are running, you know somebody else's long arm kit that you said it doesn't work with because I mean, you can't make Legos connects and Lincoln logs all play together. Right. And there's only going to be so much compatibility. So. Right. Excellent comparison. I'm going to use that one. You can't make Lincoln logs, <laughs> Legos and Technics fit together. It doesn't work. I stole that one from Wes, but it's <laughs> too good. Great. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, and I think it's actually really interesting. You talk about iterative design because we, I kind of hit on this when talking about some lift kits, when talking about how different companies came into the JL market, where some kind of came in with the idea of limiting cost and said, look, we've only got X amount of dollars here. We're not going to do a lot of R&D because it's not in their business model. It's not in their whatever. So they said, you know, we're just going to get close and send it. And that's kind of what it is, which, you know, not saying that's bad. But it's just what they did. And but that's their place in the market. They understand their place in the market. Cool. But then other companies, suspension wise, we mentioned I mentioned rock crawler specifically because you want to talk about iterative design and suspension. <laughs> Jeremy Pyrrhic about owns that because I mean it is like every every time you turn around, he's doing something different. And then you find out, you know, the public finds out, well. You know, we're doing this, but we've been testing this for three years. We're doing this, but we've been testing this in Ultra 4. We've been <laughs> testing this in this rig or this. And no, he didn't tell anybody. Like, you can count on one hand on number of people that he told. But, you know, no, Adventure X joints were tested for three years. And then it looked to them, you know, everybody thought it just, just magically appeared one day. And I really, really like that version of R&D because I think it is, you know, you're never going to get it perfect on your first swing. I don't care how good no. you, you're just, it's not going to happen. So to be able to, right. first of all, check your ego and say, yeah, I know I'm not perfect on the first round and then go and say, you know, cause it is your product. Like that's your, that's your labor. That's your time. That's your, that's everything you put into it to develop that product. And then to look at it and go, okay, I did it pretty good, but I know I could do it better and then take it and do it in those iterations, especially when it gets to the second and third and fourth and continuing and continuing. I and I think that's great. Now it is R and D and it costs money and you know that's what it is. Oh, yeah. But you know, but I mean, I think I like that version of R and D. And then the other version of R and D that I really, well, I like and I appreciate is your involvement with Ultra Four, um, and your shall we call it enthusiastic involvement. I have <laughs> there aren't very many people that we work with in the Ultra Four side, especially uh, on the Outlaw Off Road Racing team. That I get that I get to see get excited when we destroy their product, like <laughs> like doing stuff that it shouldn't do. It already did things that no bumper should be able to do, that no rock slider <laughs> should be able to do. So then I go out there and I do stuff that nobody's ever going to do to it. And you, you know, you come up there at KOH and you're with Wes, and you guys are just like, oh, we're going to change this, and we're going to change this, and we're going to do that. And then you know, weeks later, I'm getting pictures like, oh, this is what we're doing here. And I'm like, man, this is. That is R and D to me. So my, you know, we've had that relationship there, but I've never kind of gotten into why you got into Ultra Four and kind of what you see, because that's a whole different kind of R and D. That is entirely different. Um, and there's not a lot of companies that I've seen that are willing to put their product out there and do that. And my first thought is, why are you that crazy? But on a more professional <laughs> level, it's. You know, what do you, what, you know, from your position as, you know, that's your company, that's your product. What do you see as kind of the benefits of partnering with Ultra 4 and saying, look, I know I'm going to put my product in places that 99.99% um, .99 of my customer base is never going to see, but 
yeah, I mean, what, what in your brain is going, yeah, that's a cool idea. I'm going to do that. So, so I, I do get really excited about it. And I, I know that the devil's advocate sort of view on, you know, do you really want to put your product out there for that much testing? Because that is going to be, you know, you might go through what a JL would typically see for a, a lifetime on, on just somebody's weekend warrior vehicle. That might happen before you finish lap one of the hammers. Uh, it's essentially living all nine lives if it even gets through lap three. And, you know, who, who's to say that something doesn't fail on the car? Is that a good look for the part? And I would have to argue, well, if, if somebody calls me and says, hey, I, I broke your part or, you know, there's a, a crack in the well, then I, I ask, well, can, can you tell me something about it? Uh, we had a guy call in and say, hey, we... We got T-boned. I need, I'm building up a new JL. And the only thing that survived <laughs> getting T-boned on the last one on the side here was, was your rock slider. Uh, the frame's not in great shape. The body is like, it's totaled. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, if you, if you get T-boned, if you get hit by a semi truck, uh, yeah, the, the frame is going to fail. The, the motor might uh, break off of its mounts there's all sorts of stuff that can go wrong and we don't need to think of bulletproof or bomb proof parts as literally indestructible. Every one of these things is going to fail at a certain point. And if you don't know where that point is, then you don't know where that point is. And uh, sometimes these things surprise us. And again, you could, you could simulate all of this in SolidWorks to a certain extent, right, right. but it comes down to, you know, how are the welds that were used to attach it to the frame at the install shop that the customer went to all, all of that, when it comes to ultra four racing, I'm, I'm not afraid to see the, the part fail. I, I want to see where it fails. I want to see how it fails. I want to incorporate that into the next iteration because uh, many of our parts, the, the JL front diff skid and pinion guard that we've got, that thing's on version eight. Uh, wow. That's insane. Some of that are are updates that we wanted to make. Uh, most of it was that Jeep came out with like seven different front axle housings. Yeah, they do. Uh, until they went common, and then we had to 3D scan all of them and figure out which design would fit all of them uh, appropriately. But we never we never want to be done and on to our last version until the the JL or the platform is. Uh, done going through changes as well. And even after that, I imagine we're going to have more new ideas. And when you're out on the ultra four course, uh, you're, you're going to get a lot more testing done rapidly uh, compared to what I do with my daily driver. I drive it up and down the road to work every day. I take it to Moab. I take it to Uray. Uh, maybe I'll slam it into a, a rock so hard that I, you know, bend up the body a little bit. Uh, I haven't been able to do that quite the way you have, though, and seeing how the body will kind of twist on the back of the JL has us uh, thinking about, hey, how do we redesign this corner armor? How do we get rid of the tail lamp cut out and do some reinforcements right here? Is it worth it for guys that are doing competition stuff to figure out a way to tie that into the roll cage? Uh, things like that. Now, I've got 100 ideas a day, and not all of them are good, and that's uh, also part of the creative R&D process uh, is the, the team helps me filter out some of the bad ideas as well. But uh, you have these lingering questions when you just bolt it onto a vehicle that sees street use or moderate rock crawling. You don't have many of those lingering questions after you see it go through, uh, you know, a couple Ultra 4 seasons. That's fair. Yeah, we answered all the questions there. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, kind of something to tack onto that, though, a lot of the bigger companies that spend a lot of their budget for products on the manufacturing side, <clears throat> within once they've got that set, you know, base R&D done, they start manufacturing, they pump so much of that stuff out that they can't afford to change those part and SKU numbers and update that quickly, whereas Ultra 4 happens every year. <laughs> so you've got an opportunity every year to put your your newest products or whatever you want 
through literally the toughest race in the world um, and see how it's going to respond. So you have that opportunity every single year to make those updates and changes and, and to kind of, to just, fly fly on really quickly and uh and that's kind of what's cool about having i don't want to say a small shop because next venture is no small facility at all um you guys are pumping out stuff and sending things all across the country and i would imagine probably even under other countries at this point um so i think that's something really cool and to be able to think about especially when it comes to r&d um is the ability in quickness to turn around like we see in rock crawler they do that almost you know every couple of years as well um, constantly bettering themselves so that their customers are always getting the best of the best from them, which I think is is pretty awesome. But I kind of have a question for both of you. Um, why? What? What led to you putting parts on forty six ninety nine? Did Doug reach out to you? Did you reach out to Doug, or how did that come about? The the real story is actually pretty funny. From what I recall, I uh, I had a re- sort of a, a message relayed to me on my desk by our sales guy, Tyler. He's like, hey, this guy says he's uh, sponsored by Outlaw to do all this install work with all these other parts and these other big names. Uh, do you know anything about this? And it's like, you know, I should probably reach out to Doug and ask what kind of build they're thinking about doing. Also, I don't know if this guy's been in the off-road industry for more than three days, so I'm, I'm curious uh, what's going on here. Uh, from this this proposal and i get a message or reply from doug saying oh i've I've got a proposal i've uh well doug do you you remember what you sent me that wasn't the um that was not the original marketing deck that came sometime later (laughs) and i'm sitting here thinking i'm starting to remember this and i'm like who was that dude like i'm trying to remember this now well I, i i remember getting a message back from you well well, my proposal involves, uh, you know, an ultra four car that's already got some of your parts on it. Uh, I do remember that. Yeah. And it did. And it did. Yeah. And I think we had chatted before, before then at, at some point, and it, it did already have a couple of parts on there that, uh, that JP had reached out, mm-hmm. uh, about. And man, I, I had, I was, I was so excited when, when Jeremy had reached out and said, Hey, there's an opportunity to test a part on a car. And it was one part man I, I really wish there were more opportunities like that and then then along comes outlaw off road and doug yeah i think my deal you know when we when i originally talked to jp about getting that car i'd obviously reached out to people before even a lot of the public even knew we were getting that car because mo- most people don't realize i actually owned that car at koh 2023 even though no like very very few people knew we kind we kind of just kind of snuck in there we stuck a sticker on it, but that deal was to let Jeremy drive it for that race. Um, so, and that was, that was kind of the end of the three year deal that he had with Jeep. And we said, okay, well, that's, you're going to obviously fulfill that deal with, with Jeep. And then we're going to kind of take over the car. But in doing that, obviously some of it was just simply selfish. You know, you just want to make the car, you just want to make the car your own. Right. And going several years back, I think Dan, we, the first time we ever talked was probably, 2018 or 2019 when um uh there was a conversation three of me you and kevin williams Lightbright, yeah we were developing yeah. something from them that's what that's what it was and I, it was 18 or 19 so i was familiar i was familiar with the company because i did you know kevin is the one who introduced me to you and the next venture motorsports and i had seen all the stuff coming off and we had we had sold a couple of things so i knew of the company um and through i think it was through kind of your original development when i came to know you was the fender flares which unfortunately was the one thing with you i was like well i can't use the one thing that i knew you were coming out with because of ultra four rules but right. we can do this and i and i wanted to do something number one i wanted to do something um that aesthetically that i liked um because i got a lot i mean you know, i gotta like the car right i don't want to have just ugly stuff on on the race car but it also needed to be – it had to be U.S. built. It had to be U.S. made. It had to tick a lot of boxes for me, and Next Venture ticked all those boxes for me. Luckily, after last season, yes, we do now have much more Next Venture product on there. Um, but I just – I had faith. Um, I knew some of the stuff that you had done. I knew some of the stuff that Kevin had done to your product. So, you know, the base of, the base of trust was already there. 
Um, and like you said, with racing, you don't know until you know, you don't know the limit until you know the limit. So um, there was an opportunity there to do something different. And that was a, for me, it was just kind of an idea, but in reaching out to you and then that, that level of excitement will be, Oh, absolutely. It's not even a question. Like what's the shipping address? <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> where is this stuff going to? I was like, all right. Cause we like, you know, Warren's like that rock crawl is like that next venture motorsports like that. We as race car drivers and, and, and by extension owners, we prefer companies who prefer us. We want, we want to be excited to work with companies who want to be excited to work with us because that's, you know, we as outlaw off-road push the fact that we run 4,600 and that we run it because it's a stock class, because it's a class that you can, that we are actively pursuing and developing products with companies and that we are running stuff that to a large extent you can buy from your local off-road shop from an outlaw off-road or direct from the manufacturer, depending on, you know, how you purchase your parts. So when you get a company that's that excited about it and, and something as important as armor, I would argue armor and suspension are the two things that can, that, that probably have the largest impact on your ability to actually race, obviously suspension, what you can do at speed, what you can go over and then armor. I mean, it's no secret in several races, uh, both in the 2023 season and even starting 2024 in KOH that I was not afraid to use next venture armor against other vehicles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and and that and that that uh that confidence was was backed up by the fact that you know we didn't change any armor last year we didn't you know the bumper we started with was the bumper we ended with the bump the rock sliders we started with are still on the car the only reason we changed the front was because i wanted a lighting redesign and you had a new bumper that that had lighting in it so we we changed for that more of kind of you know just that iterative thing but the bumper was fine. Um, and so all that stuff's still on there. The rock sliders are still on there. You know, that corner armor could probably still be on there. The corner <laughs> armor's still on there. And and it, and it worked flawlessly. Again, being in a train of five or six Ultra 4 cars that are trying to push each other through an obstacle, you don't expect anything to stay to, to work again but to be able to do that it really doesn't have that much of an effect on the car you move on and, and do what you got to do and don't have that concern i mean that's huge and i would say that you know suspension and armor the two that you gotta have that right you absolutely gotta have that right to race or you're not gonna race very long oh yeah, yeah. it's it's important in racing and it's also something that if, if you're shopping around looking for uh, you know, trail armor and suspension that's going to ride nice and hold up over time. Uh, if it'll last through a hammers race, it might last me 17 years with a couple of rebuilds on on my you know weekend warrior. Yep, absolutely. Type of JL. So absolutely. So how does that trickle down to like like you just said a customer rig that might not see that abuse for 17 years? How is that? how was that a selling point for, for you guys? Is, is that something you market or is that, um, you know, just how does that sell into the, the customer aspect? Well, I, I think often we'll get somebody on the phone. That's like, Hey, I looked through all the pictures. This looks like it's, uh, absolutely the product that I'm after. Uh, but there'll be questions like, well, how, how well does this hold up? I'm going to be really wheeling this mm -hmm. thing really, really hard. And, uh, as as Doug pointed out, we we originally talked because of uh, Kevin Williams and Lightbright, and you know Kevin and Brittany are uh, fantastic at testing things to see if uh, if somebody can break it on the trail. Uh, Kevin's usually going to take that as a personal challenge to be that guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess you're going to have to quote me on saying that, but uh, he's he's pretty hard on stuff and. Uh, when somebody calls in and asks us, Hey, how does, how does this hold up? Um, uh, oftentimes our, our sales guy will just say, well, Hey, if you're asking about the rock sliders, um, it is, you know, it, it's on the 4699 car and you know, the, these things have been through, through hell and back. And, uh, you know, if, if you can make a move, we've, we've got a customer that's uh, been T-boned from the side. We're not going to, advertise on our website in text that these are in any way uh 
rated for getting hit by a Mack truck on the uh, from the side. Nobody's what's that certification? Gonna... <laughs> I don't think that one exists. Uh, but it's you know when you're having that real conversation at an expo or over the phone and and like it it is definitely one of those the the proof is is in it right here at ultra four or on these hardcore trails uh ultra four is is kind of hard to beat as a measure of uh abuse that it will hold up to and if if you can drive up back door in your jl and not cave in the side of the rock slider uh most people are going to go yeah i'm i'm going to drive hard but not that hard so i think those are the rock sliders for me and they're going to last forever and if i've got a frame mount them by welding them i want to know that they're going to last forever because they're not coming off not without a, a plasma right. torch uh you want to make that decision yeah, absolutely. for the life of the vehicle at that point so you don't want to bolt or weld something on that you're going to have to pull off that may have failed and taken out something else with it right and i've i've actually been in uh the i've been in those shoes a couple times of Trusting someone's parts and then it fails. And then next thing you know, I'm having to redrill 40,000 body holes to put new inserts in. And it's just not fun. And yeah, no, uh, I would much, much rather buy something. You know, it's going to last for life. And uh, it's been tested many, many times over. And uh, I mean, maybe there should be a Doug certification. Maybe that's the Mack truck. Look, certification. It's not my it's just, fault. It's Doug rated. It's Okay, <laughs> it is no secret that forty six ninety nine is not a small vehicle, right? It is a, it is a four door, full body, mostly full body, JL. This is not a small vehicle. This is a four door wheelbase, one hundred eighteen to one hundred twenty inches. It is, it is now it is seventy inch axles, three and a half inch back spacing on the. This is not a small vehicle, and to put this thing, you know, the joke is, you know, Doug, you know, I got to avoid trees because of the one steering incident in Kentucky last year. But when you get into a place like, you know, Pennsylvania was this way last year and there were certain spots in Arizona and certainly on the rock lap of KOH, you know, those KOH rock trails are pretty much, you are constantly on the steering. It is left. It is right. It is left and right while going up and down, you are pitched and what you end up forcing, what you end up being forced to do in that situation for any hardcore wheelers in a, in a four door JL, you know, this to be true. You end up forcing yourself to pull into a rock and you place your rock slider deliberately on that rock and you goose it. And, and, and it, you know, it comes around, you're throttle turning that thing. And when that, you know, that ends up, if you want to be successful, that has to be part of the plan. Like you have to be able to just know, I'm not going to try to avoid this rock because I'm going to waste time trying to swing it wide and back up and try to save my butt. You can't do that. You just can't. You can't do that if you're going to be competitive in any way, shape, or form. Um, if you're trying to, if you're, if you're trying to seek podiums, you can't race that way. So naturally, the progression is: look, you know, we did it in Arizona last year. We knew there was a spot where we were going to ride on the rear bumper. We just knew that was going to happen. So we knew that when we dropped down mm -hmm. and we dropped the, we didn't have, we're on 35 <clears throat> and we're shock travel limited. So we knew that our tire was not going to touch the ground. So we were basically going to have to drop down, get on this fin, this rock fin that was three, four feet high. And we were going to drag the rear bumper down. There was no other way to do it. And, and we did that and it was fine. And we did the same thing at KOH where we said, look, we know we're going to have to go left. We know we're going to have to go right in these super tight spots that, um, when KOH purists, you know, the old hammers purists were like that. It, we're just, we're just a school bus, right? We're huge by comparison yeah. to some of these other vehicles. And the only way to mitigate that is to, you know, use what you got. And what we had was a very, very strong set of rock sliders and a very <laughs> strong bumper setup where we could go in and just, and you know, that's just what you got to do. So, um, it is R and D for sure. Um, the only thing I would say kind of, you know, we know what that looks like, right? We know what R and D looks like. We know that is R and D, and we know what the what the finished product is. How I know you're in Grand Junction. I'm assuming everything's made in house. What is your process? Because I'm interested in this. What's the process to take it from? Hey, we've R and D this, and I know you're iterative and all that. To what they actually see on the car, because 
that that part didn't just magically appear on the car. You had to R and D it first. You did some some other form of R and D. Then you built this part. How does how does that go with you guys? Because I know some people farm stuff out. Some people do stuff in house. How does that work with Next Venture Motorsports to go from R and D to consumer part? So really, I think it starts with a, a vision of where do we want to end up, uh, and then kind of getting that out onto the proverbial paper or the napkin sketch. Uh, of SolidWorks is our preferred tool here, uh, modeling all of that up. And a lot of times the, the first barrier that we have to overcome is, hey, do we have a good 3D scan or good CAD data? Uh, if we don't, we're going to go out into the shop and we're going to get out the 3D scan spray uh, and scan what we need, get that into SolidWorks, make sure that we are starting with a precise design We've really moved away from, you know, the cardboard aided design since it's, you know, the pricing on 3D scanners has come down tremendously since I started doing this at least. And from there, we'll, we'll come up with the, all the 3D stuff, uh, the three dimensional model as a whole, make sure that it's going to fit with our brake tooling and then figure out how to flatten that into, uh, something that we can cut on the laser. Because the, the next step beyond that is turn it back into three-dimensional by taking it over the brake and forming it. We've got a, I want to say it's a 120-ton press, 10-foot beam on it. That's where we do all of our forming. Anything that can be formed, cold formed, uh, instead of welded, is going to uh, put less heat into the product. It's going to warp less. It's going to reduce the cost and the price to the consumer in the end. And we'll take that, we'll make sure that that fits up around our uh, our jig. Uh, today, for example, we we're working on some uh, JL corner armor. Uh, it, it's a custom one that doesn't have a fuel door cut out on it. It's for the 4699 hmm. car. What, would, what and, purpose would that serve? Oh. oh yeah, race car fuel cell. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't need that cut out anymore. Nope, nope I don't. So that, that starts out completely flat on the laser, and then um, the, the forming on that, that's mostly just one piece. Uh, it's very similar to our uh, previous iterations of the corner armor. Uh, and that's got to fit up on a jig. We've got to make sure that everything matches the jig and that it can be bolted essentially to the jig while Brian is uh, TIG welding it back there to close up any of the relief cuts in it. And... Uh, from there, we're going to polish it out, smooth it out, and do some test fitting, typically. Now, this one is probably going to be test fit directly on the, the 4699 car, but I did cut two sets, one with the fuel door, because I want to take the other set and put it on mine. So <laughs> we, we don't like to, to skip that test fit uh, step before shipping something that is new or changed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we might make an exception every now and then if it's one of our really close partners like uh, Doug and Outlaw Off-Road. They, they know that they're probably going to have to do a little bit of body work and tweaking already on that section of the body. Uh, it's probably not going to bolt up in, in one shot. But for most of our customers, it typically does. And we, we really want to make sure that we went through the whole checklist of everything before it even hits the laser. And... I mean, it's, it's not like any of my body lines match stock jails anyway at this point. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is very that, true. Yeah, that 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 left, especially that left rear corner has been reworked by at least one forty six car, at least at least one forty eight hundred car. Like, yeah, that's that that's it's fine. <laughs> but we're making now, those. Speaking of corners, uh, I'm sorry, Kelp. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was going to say, speaking of corners, and one of the challenging. Um, things with that and why a lot of companies don't or haven't attempted corner armor um, is mm -hmm. that radius. Um, how do you, how do you address that? So there's, there's a few companies out there doing it now. Uh, I want to say that we were the, the first to get a set out to market or possibly prototype one at all. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had done TJ corners previously. We had done a couple of JK prototypes even, and, it's if you look at a TJ or a YJ or a CJ, they're pretty much all the same, like a three inch radius around the back. You just give it one hit and mm -hmm. you're done. You make sure everything's in the right place and that you put the bend in the right spot. It's 
an actual radius. When you look at the JL, uh, it's a variable radius around the bottom there. And there's compound curves, mm -hmm. like a lot of other cars. A TJ is very flat. You look from top to bottom on a TJ and mm -hmm. LJ. It's a box. Perfectly flat. Uh, so this is a matter of, it may look flat in a lot of areas, but it's got a bunch of very small bends in it the whole way through to kind of match that compound curve. And that was a really fun uh, modeling challenge that uh, previous <laughs> to that, I had not uh, seen that on a Jeep, at least. You know, you're, you're not trying to stick corner armor on your, you know, 34 Ford fender. You'd have to be absolutely crazy to try to make a fender out of sheet metal that has compound curves. But then again, we're, we're starting to kind of almost play with that on the front flares for the JL that we're building now is how do we make this look uh, like a seamless, almost factory piece? Because at a certain point, you get too blocky and it looks a little bit like a F-117 Nighthawk or something. And... <laughs> Like if, if you like that like look, it. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not saying there's not a preference or a segment of the market that doesn't want that, but uh, I almost have to ask the question of: Do do the best parts on your vehicle stick out, or do they blend in like they came that way from the factory? Like that's how the factory should have built it. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's something I noticed about all of your products actually is that every single thing that I've seen, whether it's on the race car, whether it's on Kevin and Brittany's JL, whether it's on even down to um, just TJ LJ stuff, it looks like it belongs exactly where it is. Um, so it's really cool to hear about the corner arcs. I know you guys were one of the first ones to do that. And that's always boggled my mind of how, how that's even done in engineering having been in a manufacturing setting before and seeing how that works and everything's on a jig but i'm like how do you jig up a compound yeah, i still don't know how like that um nope, yeah no, no. come um, by the shop anytime so with that yeah <laughs> i'd love to uh so with that like is there anything different about the the next venture manufacturing process that that separates you guys from you know any other manufacturing center out there um I, I think often what I've run into, uh, have, having worked with some other sheet metal vendors, uh, you know, oftentimes you'll you'll uh, sort of meet this off-road um, team, and it might just be the ownership team or the leadership team of a company that wants to do these parts, but they may not have the familiarity with the manufacturing. And then you'll have other shops that are, they have come from the manufacturing side but maybe that's all they know. And this is the way we've always done it is sometimes one of those approaches to how to get that part done. And I think one of the key differences here is uh, a lot of the guys on the, on the shop floor here, they have off-road rigs at home. And if I bring them a design and mm -hmm. say, Hey, we can, this is the easy way it'll, you know, it'll save us a ton of time. Customers may not like it as much. It'll be the best thing that's out there right now. Uh, here's the other design, though, and it's way over the top to to get it this smooth, and it's going to be a little bit painful on the first few to figure it out. And I got so many car guys and Jeep guys and Bronco guys, and, I mean, I, I, share, I share an office with, uh, our other cab designer here, Jacob, and he is legitimately, he has raced the area BFE race in ultra four in his Range Rover classic. Uh, these guys don't like to shy away from that, that challenge. And sometimes we, we go that extra mile, but it's, it's gotta be the whole team that's willing to do that. And I, I think that might be part of the difference here. I, and I, I, I'm I really proud that. to work with mm -hmm. this team. So most most, if not all, of your process is in-house then, right? Uh, UHMW, we have that process uh, down the street here in Grand Junction as well. Local, uh, okay. It's local. Wow. We don't have a router. We don't uh, We do not do any of that. So we, we send out for that. Uh, and we've got a guy uh, local that does our powder coat for us when things get ordered powder coated. Uh, but otherwise, we're bringing in the steel flat, aluminum flat. 
putting it on the laser, uh, bending it up here. We've got uh, four welding cells here. Uh, the R&D bay can sometimes become the fifth welding cell when we need a little bit of surge capacity. Uh, and then, I mean, 90% of our customers are uh, buying direct at this point and uh, getting a UPS package from us after we get it all wrapped up. I mean, that just that is impressive. Yeah, that's... But yeah, it's very Especially impressive. these days. But doing that, you're able to track down, like, you know, the quality of steel mm -hmm. and make sure that's that the huge. quality of steel and aluminum is, is up to par. Because uh, that's something else Doug and I have talked about in the past, too, of uh, brands that go a little bit cheaper might not have the best quality steel or U.S. made steel, which has certain regulations. So that's super cool to see that you guys take that from, from very, very step one and that you're doing it all in-house. Um, that's pretty amazing, actually, because it's it's starting to become more and more common to see, you know, a parts house or a, or a fabrication house just kind of doing a lot of things for a lot of people. And it's hard to keep up the quality of work when you mm -hmm. do stuff like that. Um, but speaking of those parts, anything new coming that we should uh, be on the lookout for? Uh, there are two things at the, the top of my mind because we've been working on pretty much all week trying to get them in a really good spot. One is the uh, the corner armor, we've, we've had that out for a while, but we've always incorporated the space for a factory tail lamp or one of our little replacement pieces in there if you don't want that sticking out of the back. Uh, and mm -hmm. we've, we've had some customers asking for a while, can I get this without the tail lamp cut out? Uh, initially, compatibility with uh, factory tail lamps keeps you good if you've got, you know, the backup, uh, not the backup sensors, the, uh, that, uh, the blind spot. That blind, blind system. spot detectors, yeah, 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 yeah. which is why they stick yeah. out so far to begin with. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be bringing that to the market. We've got a good marketing partner that's going to take that through its paces. Hey, -o. on their Ultra Four car. <laughs> uh, we're doing some add-ons for the rear aluminum bumper, so you can actually tie that into your hitch mounting locations on the on the cross member. Uh, as well as a piece of UHMW that'll cover up that rear cross member and part of the bumper as well. And Jacob, our other designer, our resident Ultra 4 driver here, uh, actually drew that up uh, this week as well. So we're going to have those coming out. And then we, we do have some trusses in the work for guys that want to run big tires on their JL or JT. Uh, we, we get questions about that all the time. I've actually been running one of ours for, for months now, uh, kind of just doing some some testing, and we, we haven't advertised that or, or anything yet, but we'll probably be seeing that come out either during or after EJS here. Dude, I should have called you. I knew awesome. it. I literally <laughs> – so a couple weeks ago <clears throat> now we bought the – I got a new, a new show, an event Jeep, um, because you can't always have, obviously, you can't, can't always take the race car to shows and events. That doesn't that doesn't speak to the whole market, right? You need kind of a you need kind of a mall crawler. So I said, look, I'm going to buy a new Jeep because we got Mob Moab coming up. We got that event coming up in May. We're going to be I'm going to finally get to see the next Venture Motorsports shop out there in May. Oh yeah, looking forward to that. And um, so I bought this Jeep, and I said, you know, we're going to do something that Outlaw had the number four. It's going to it's a four by E. So I said, I'm going to we're going to put 38s on it. We're going to do a couple things and. Um, I'm going to keep the factory axles on it. I had talked a little bit about axle swapping it, but I think we're going to keep the, the factory axles on it. And y when you look around for trusses and stuff, that's, there's a hole for that right now. You wouldn't think that there's a hole in that market for trusses and gussets and stuff on a 44, or I guess the M220 and M210 on the, on the JL. Um, right. there is, there absolutely is a hole in that market when you look for stuff. Very, very few players in that game. So super happy to see you're going to be getting into that. Look forward to seeing those and getting those on some on some of our builds and definitely for customers. But I can also tell you that I'm really excited oh, yeah. about that corner armor because that is a thing. Like that's, you know, you saw it at the Ultra 4, right? You saw it at KOH. That metal there on that body is so thin that it just doesn't take much to just completely buckle that mm -hmm. in. And now you're you in serious body damage territory where, you know, Obviously, corner armor is not a, a be all end all. It's a consumable, but I would rather damage that that's a replaceable part than destroy a tub that you really, I mean, good luck replacing that, guys, because it's just not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. So when you looked at that and you saw <laughs> that, easy. I saw the Instagram video, the little cool thing when you pulled the light out. Like, 
that was destroyed. Like the body is done. Like I'm going to, if I was actually going to go in there and fix that, if I was a regular customer, that insurance bill, that bill would be astronomical. <laughs> so if you can look and get a piece of armor, yeah. one piece of armor um, and fix and really just address that and fix that, that's awesome. And then for the bumper piece too, underneath being able to tie in the hitch, getting that piece of metal on there. Cause some of us apparently use it as a skid plate. Um, that's, that's that has responded to the market. That's what we talk about with R and D. So excited to see that coming. Really excited. I actually had no idea you were working on trusses and gussets. So I'm glad to be glad to get that world premiere on that information. So super happy. Which is funny because we know, just talked we about did. some of those parts. <laughs> we and absolutely on did. The previous we episode. Absolutely did. So if you haven't seen that yep, one, we should go did. back a couple yep. episodes and, and watch that one because we definitely talk about uh axle upgrades, trusses, gussets, and all kinds of fun stuff on there. Uh, and before we wrap up, just because I'm a little curious, anything coming out for uh, TJLJ? I know said your, your main focus is JLJT, <laughs> but I got to know. Go. Uh, <laughs> so we we actually very recently came out with uh, LJ Aluminum Corner Armor. Uh, mm-hmm. I've been eyeballing them. So <laughs> there's that. Uh, we might have some, some rocker guards uh, in, in the works uh, in aluminum and steel, kind of going back to our, our roots there, but okay. more of a wheel well to wheel well rather than messing around with factory fender flares, mm-hmm. uh, things like that. And I mean, I've, I've, I've got a, I mentioned I've got a Jeep Commando project. It's actually sitting on a LJ frame and I want to do oh, a wow. few things with, with that as well. And I, I might be, uh, actually hitting up JP for some help on, a on the uh, the long arm, the flat belly system for that. But I want to do a few mm-hmm. things a little bit differently and make sure that I've got my motor and my transmission kind of covered as well. And so we will be doing doing more of our, you know, back to our roots on TJLJ era nice. stuff as well. I know that makes Caleb happy. Awesome. Is that it makes me very happy to see some <laughs> see some LJ love. I mean it, I mean it's hard to find A, well well taking care of TJLJs, but B, you've got guys who are stupid like me and decide, Oh, I'm going to do the flat belly skid, stretch it 43s and go all out with this thing. So no, I'm just, I'm always curious to see if, uh, see if we're getting some love too, but you know, JK or I'm sorry, uh, JL JT is always come first. And I get that for now, for now. <laughs> well, there will be the redheaded step 10 years from now. It was like JL's for poor people. That's just going to happen. Like, it's going to be the J M two three what the heck ever yeah well i will say the, i know at least two of those parts that dan mentioned um for anybody out there that wants to see them those parts will be on 46.99 in probably the next week or so and they will be that corner armor will be on 46.99 after we massage the body a little bit uh that'll be for the body massaging my fault not your part and we're going to have that new <laughs> rear bumper on the back of 46.99 for the kentucky race that is coming up uh in april we've got uh f- four weeks or so before we load up so the countdown, countdown is on. definitely on uh for that and then we've got some other things that the car we might actually have even have it on the car this time next week hopefully uh as the car is supposed to be going to the opening weekend of the carolina cobras national arena league football game at the greensboro coliseum in north carolina so pretty excited for that if we can make that happen and then definitely obviously racing comes first so it's going to be at that race so those parts will be on the car for the Ultra Four race in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So be a, be a, be on the lookout for that. So um, I think that's where we are going to leave it today. Um, I did not feel like that was that long of an interview. This was a full episode, but it was it went so by went by so mm-hmm. fast. But you know, time flies when you're having fun. So um, I had a great time, yeah. Dan. Again, thank you for agreeing to come on here with us. And coming on here, sharing so much about kind of your process and where you guys came from, where you're at, where you're going. Always, always like to hear that and kind of give a side of companies and and their teams that you don't really get just kind of searching around Facebook and Instagram and all of that, kind of giving that insight. So really, really thankful for having you on and giving us your time today, as well as to everyone out there in the world, listening, uh, watching, following along. Uh, thank you, thankful for all of you. Thank you all. We'll thank you every single episode. We'll, we've always done it. We'll continue to do it uh, because without people to talk to and people to show and share this stuff with, there's really no reason in doing it. So on that note, please make sure like, like us, comment on this video. If you're watching it, give us that rating on Apple podcast, like comment, subscribe. We say that every time we want to keep doing this and putting out content for everyone. And that is going to help us do that. So uh, for Outlaw Off-Road, 
for Caleb, for Dan and Next Venture Motorsports, thank you all for being here. That is going to do it for us for this week. Make sure you tune in on Friday for the mailbag. Uh, maybe we'll get some armor questions. You guys drop those questions uh, down in the comments. But other than that, we are done here. We will see you on Friday for the mailbag and then next week for another episode of Dirt to Dust. You've been listening to Dirt to Dust. Presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.